Sullivan Soren holds a bachelor's degree from Rutgers University in American Studies, a master's degree in Museum Studies from the Cooperstown Graduate Program, and a PhD from Albany University in History. She is director and distinguished professor of the Cooperstown Graduate Program. Dr. Soren has more than 30 years of experience as a museum consultant working for more than 250 museums. She has served as an exhibition guest curator for many major exhibitions, including In the Spirit of Martin, The Living Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for the Smithsonian Institute Traveling Exhibition Service, Through the Eyes of Others, African Americans and Identity in American Art, Bridges and Boundaries, African Americans and American Jews for the Jewish Museum in New York, and Wilderness Cure, Tuberculosis and the Adirondack, Adirondacks for the Adirondack Museum. Dr. Shoren is uh, the recipient of too many honors to name tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, she writes and lectures frequently on African American history and museum practice. Her books include Touring Historic Harlem, Four Walks in Northern Manhattan, uh, which she co-wrote with uh, architectural historian Andrew Dolcart, In the Spirit of Martin, The Living Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Through the Eyes of Others, African Americans and Identity in American Art, Case Studies in Cultural Entrepreneurship, How to Create Relevant and Sustainable Institutions. Dr. Soren's most recently published book, Driving While Black, African American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights, explores the role that the automobile has played in the lives of African Americans during the Jim Crow era, the way that uh, African Americans expressed middle-class American values through car ownership, and how cars helped change deeply entrenched racial etiquette. Uh, thank you, Dr. Soren, for taking time to uh, time this evening to share your work and expertise with us. And uh, may I just point out again that Dr. Soren is a, a Jersey girl, uh, raised <laughs> in Newark, and and also uh, nearby Piscataway uh, uh, in Colonia. So um, we want to uh, welcome her back home <laughs> to Jersey virtually. And again, thank you so much for uh, for joining us tonight and for sharing your, your work and your expertise with us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I see that a, a bunch of my former students have joined us tonight and a current student, so I'm thrilled. Um, and thank you so much. And they're, they're all good friends, so it's, it's great to see your faces. And uh, uh, Sylvain Bissonnette, who is one of my uh, police contacts, who is the commander of the police in Montreal, is also joined us. So. Um, it's great to see you and, and Catherine Sylvan, thank you. Um, so what I'd, I'd like you all to think about this evening is think about how important mobility is to you. Think about how important it is that you can just get in your car and, and go wherever you want, whenever you want. You wanna go to the grocery store, you wanna go shopping, whatever it is you want to do, mobility is really an important aspect of, of your life. And it's something that we all take for granted. Um, the right to mobility is ingrained in every free, free society, and it's ingrained in American democracy. And I would like to talk this evening about the significant role that that mobility has um, in African American life. And I'm going to share my screen with you if you give me just one minute. This virtual world that we live in is, a, is really something.
That was Christian Automobile with the Dixie Hummingbirds. I love it. So I've, I've, the louder, the better. Um, so let, let's take this all the way back to the beginning. Any discussion about travel and movement, mobility for African Americans has to start with the ordeal of the Middle Passage and enslavement. Um, and this is really what begins the journey of African Americans from slavery to freedom and the idea that forced travel shapes what it means to be a black American. Hmm. Sorry. Let's see why this is going the wrong way. But the mobility for African Americans in the New World is strictly controlled. What you're looking at here is a slave pass. So if you were an enslaved person, you would have to have a pass from your master that gave you permission to travel. And this one says, please to let Benjamin McDaniel pass to Dr. Henkel's in Newmarket, Shenandoah County, Virginia, and return, sorry, and return on Monday, June 1st, 1843, and it's signed Mrs. Madison. That's Mrs. James Madison. So you had to have a pass or you had to have a badge that showed that, that showed that you were permitted to travel. So freedom was so important to many enslaved persons that they ran away. They sold themselves and exercised their freedom of mobility. Now I want you to keep in mind, and this really pertains to where we are today, the very first police forces in this country were slave patrols. Many urban areas, as well as rural areas, established slave patrols that guarded communities at night to intimidate the enslaved population and to search for fugitive slaves and prevent them from running away. And here you see an example of a slave patrol. And here you see an example of the deputies badges and the plantation police badges that they carried. Now these were legal police forces and they were the first ones in the country. In the early 20th century, African Americans once again begin um, to de demonstrate their freedom of mobility. And here they are uh, as part of the Underground Railroad, which is the greatest mass movement of people in this country's history. African Americans participating in the Great Migration were seeking job opportunities in the North and also fleeing the, the intimidation the poverty and the racism in the South. Oh, and by the way, this is a photograph from Cranberry, New Jersey. Oh dear, okay, here we go. In the first half of the 20th century, behavior for African Americans was prescribed by geography and by custom, and much of the country was segregated either by law or simply by tradition, by custom. Each state had its own rules of etiquette. Each state has, had its own behavior. And each community, you were expected to know what that etiquette was. Emmett Till didn't know the rules of racial etiquette, for example, and that's why he ended up um, being murdered. Driving etiquette was also expected once the automobile became the popular method of travel. But for African Americans, both buses, and this is obviously the bus waiting room, and um, railroad cars were segregated. But it was the automobile that became the favored method of travel for African Americans. And it really freed black travelers from the tyranny of the Jim Crow railroad car and the Jim Crow bus. It offered freedom of movement. And most of all, it offered dignity but car travel was not without its own worries. Um, African Americans found that there were dangers when they went out on the road as well in their cars. By the 1950s, the interstate highway system was enabling upwardly mobile black families to be travel consumers. 
They were consumers of refrigerators and television sets and percolators, but they also used their discretionary money to purchase automobiles and campers and hotel rooms and restaurant meals at African-American establishments. With the history of forced travel that we've already discussed, it was really important to the black middle class to travel for leisure, to choose to travel. And often parents worked very hard to make sure that their children were not, a worry, or not aware of the indignities that they faced when they traveled. Now the make and model of cars that African-Americans purchased was very important and very deliberate. There were a series of market studies of African-Americans conducted in the 1940s and 1950s by market research firms for the black press. And black motorists pre preferred specific makes of cars for reasons that were related specifically to race. I believe that African-Americans preferred large cars because they offered protection, a place to sleep if you had to, a place to carry lots of supplies. So they had large trunks. They would carry water for the radiator, extra fan belts, a, a cooler full of food since restaurants and hotels, unless they were African-American owned, would not serve you. A can, a large coffee can to pee in, and blankets and pillows. Black motorists created a home away from home in their cars, and they preferred large Buicks and Oldsmobiles that were heavy and hard for a mob to turn over. This is um, a photograph of uh, a Buick Electra. And one of the, the Buick Electra was one of the most popular cars. And you can see this large, it was large and roomy and, and cushy for sleeping if you needed to. And the, um, the ad says, all the Electra lacks is a fireplace. I love this photograph. Now, I'm sure you've heard the stereotype that African-Americans all drove Cadillacs. African-Americans drove Cadillacs in the same percentage as other Americans did, and that was only 3%. But it was because of attitudes toward African-Americans that there, were, there was a popular stereotype that Black people were buying cars beyond their station in life. But we do know that popular performers who could well afford a Cadillac, like Chuck Berry seen, seen here, Mahalia Jackson um, and others felt the need that they had to justify their purchases of Cadillacs simply because they were African-American. When civil rights worker Medgar Evers needed a car, he was traveling through rural Mississippi. He chose an Oldsmobile Rocket 88. Now the Rocket 88 was large enough to accommodate Medgar who was over six feet tall. It had really big cushy seats. And it responded most importantly immediately when he hit the gas pedal, enabling him to get away from a pursuing car. So having a fast car was also important if you were doing the kind of work that Medgar Evers was doing. And this is the Rocket 88. Sadly, Medgar Evers died beside his car in his driveway shot by a sniper in June of 1963. For African-Americans, the automobile was also a symbol of class status, as it was for all Americans. Um, African-Americans were often prevented by discrimination from purchasing houses. They couldn't get loans, and many Black neighborhoods were redlined. So they put their money into the next largest purchase, and that was a fine automobile. And here you see a Harlem street, um, and that is a Cadillac. So for African-Americans, travel by car really posed a paradox. African-Americans had the freedom to, to travel, but they were forced to stay in segregated black neighborhoods and segregated black tourist accommodations when they did travel. So let's talk for a minute about what it was like before the automobile. Most people stayed, stayed put. They didn't travel far from home. They didn't travel more than a few miles. White people generally stayed in white neighborhoods. Black people generally stayed in black neighborhoods. In some poor neighborhoods, black and white people lived side by side, but the country was generally segregated by race. But the automobile changes that. 
and African Americans start to crisscross the country, traveling through white spaces to get to other safe black spaces. Sadly, they faced signs, billboards, posters, objects that ranged from insulting to frightening. But they continued to assert their rights to mobility by going where they wanted, when they wanted. And this is an example of some of the kinds of things that African Americans faced when they went out on the road. You can imagine how frightening it would be to drive uh, into a town where you saw this welcome to Klan country sign. Or um, in, on the West Coast, this was a popular, the Coon Chicken Inn was a popular uh, chain restaurant started in Salt Lake City. Or to find this sign in Greenville, Texas, that was across the main street. It says, Greenville welcome, the blackest land, the whitest people. And the words were painted on the water tower as well as on the banner across Main Street. As they traveled, African Americans also faced sundown towns. And these are entire communities that they needed to avoid to protect themselves and their families. And there were hundreds of sundown towns in the United States, uh, and many with signs like this at the entrance or exit. Um, and some travelers also faced intimidation and real dangers if they happened to encounter uh, the Klan as they were traveling. And can you imagine what it would be like to encounter this group at a fair and everyone, everyone on the Ferris wheel is wearing their Klan robe. And this is a, a community fair in Colorado. And so a variety of books, travel guides, were created by African Americans in order to protect themselves along the road. And this is the most long lasting of those books, the Negro Motorist Green Book produced by Victor Green. The idea was based on earlier guides that were within the Jewish community that helped American Jews travel safely. <clears throat> and it listed places you could get your car fixed, places of entertainment, hotels, motels, and restaurants. And Victor Green used as his mantra, travel is fatal to prejudice, which is a quote from Mark Twain's, uh, from a Mark Twain book. Um, and he adapted it because he really believed that as people went out on the road, that if, if, if white people could just encounter African Americans, it would help them to dispel prejudice. This is Victor and Alma Green. Green was a postal worker in New Jersey and later in Harlem. Um, and he uh, designed the Green Book after having a very bad travel experience, created the Green Publishing Company. And Victor dies in 1960 and his wife, Alma, who doesn't get enough credit. Um, Alma and four women became the people that ran the Negro Motorist Green Book. It was very unusual in this time period for a woman to head up a publishing company. And this is one of Victor Green's advertisements, um, a postcard. It was one of the ways he sold his travel guide and it was, became one of the most successful of all the African-American travel guides, but primarily the success was as a result of his very smart partnership with Standard Oil. Standard Oil, uh, sent out his green book to all of their SO gas stations because of they, they had enlightened self-interest. They knew that African Americans were a potential market and they wanted to market to the black community and sell them gasoline made by SO. So the green book included gas stations and hotels and restaurants, YMCAs, churches, doctors, beauticians, barbers, and each, article, each issue also contained at least one article. And you can see that the, the Green Book courted the Black middle class and reflected Black middle class values about polite and well-mannered behavior. And here you can see very light-skinned um, Black couple from the suburbs with matched luggage and, and very well-dressed. And you can just see the, the back of their, um, of their automobile. Over the course of the life of the Green Book, the content expanded from fir the very beginning when it was only New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. It expanded to cover the entire East Coast, 
then all of the United States, then North America, and finally it expanded to Europe, Africa, and Asia. And the Baltimore, this is a, the Baltimore Afro-Americans uh, travel map. Just so you're aware, there are many, many travel guides. The Bronze American, the Go Guide, the Travel Guide, Grayson's Guide, there were dozens and dozens of these guides, which, which really tells you the, that there was a need for these, these kinds of um, publications. Many of the places that African Americans could stay in this time period were private homes and guest houses and colored YMCAs. And this is a dormitory room in a colored YMCA. And here they offered moral and spiritual uplift as well as a safe haven for discrimination within a segregated environment. <clears throat> but also women opened up their homes if they happened to have um, an extra bedroom, a spare bedroom, women would open up their homes and provide um, housing and sometimes a meal, a breakfast or a dinner. And this was a way that, that women were able to make additional money for their families. Um, and this is the rock uh, from Rock Rest, which is an African-American guest home run by Hazel uh, Sinclair in Kittery, Maine. And if you've ever been to the National African-American Museum and Cultural Center in um, Washington, DC, this rock is now a part of their collection. As a result of this project, by the way. Um, and here's a group of ladies enjoying lunch at Rock Rest. And what we see in, in these thriving businesses is that African Americans created a parallel world that was often completely unknown to white Americans. And this parallel world was designed to protect them from racism in the larger society, but also to make good lives for themselves. Um, you know, the, Hazel would open up her house, as an example, for luncheons every, every week. Segregation created a demand for this national network. And here you can see a postcard from McKenzie Court in Hot Springs, Arkansas, the South's finest Negro court. Um, most of these places were black owned, but there were some that were owned by white Americans, but that catered only to black people. Um, they offered the same values and products that were offered for whites in similar establishments. Um, some of the owners, the proprietors, put themselves in the photographs clearly to show the people that were reading the advertisements that they were African American. I'm sorry about the grainy picture, but this is, this is the way the picture was, the photograph was taken. Um, there is a documentary that talks a lot about um, the national parks being America's greatest idea. And they were a great idea, but perhaps not a very great idea for African Americans because although the national parks were open to everyone, they were segregated. And here you can see Shenandoah National Park, um, which was segregated uh, picnic grounds for Negroes. All of the national parks were open for free for African Americans, but if you got all the way out to, Ellis, uh, to uh, Yellowstone or Grand Teton, all of the concessions were segregated. So you wouldn't be able to stay um, any place that you wanted. You had to stay in segregated housing, making the national parks a place that many African Americans did not want to go. And interestingly, African Americans um, to this very day are uh, very loath to go to many of the national parks. And quickly, I'd like to talk about the automobile and civil rights because the civil rights movement would not have existed without the automobile. And here you see um, Ware Supermarket in Memphis. And Ware, uh, it, this is an ad from the Green Book, and he's tying himself to Martin Luther King, which could have been an extremely dangerous thing to do um, in the 1960s. Um, but African Americans begin to use travel as a method of quiet activism. And here you can see a civil rights march. And at the front of the march is a man holding an equal opportunity and human dignity sign. And he was staying at the A.G. Gaston Motel. Um, one of the things that people who ran tourist homes and guest houses did 
was to provide housing and food for civil rights workers. They supported the civil rights movement by providing places to meet, as well as places to eat and places to stay. The man in the front of the line was being taken back to the Gaston Motel, but here you can see, here you can see the Gaston Motel just after it was bombed. Um, <clears throat> Gaston provided room number 30, which was the place that Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference used to meet all the time. And that was the room that was bombed. Fortunately, King um, was not there. There was no one in the room at the time. But many of the places that are listed in the Negro Motorist Green Book and in other travel guides were places that very directly supported the civil rights movement by providing these services. Um, think about the Lorraine Motel, which is where Martin Luther King was staying when he was assassinated. <clears throat> Other ways that the automobile supported the movement, they were essential. If you, if you think about being a voting rights worker or a, a healthcare worker or someone who was involved in the South, uh, helping people to get to the polls, you needed a vehicle to do that. And this vehicle <clears throat> is called the Jenkins Microbus. And hand lettered on the side, it says, love is progress, hate is expensive. And this is a vehicle that traveled throughout um, a county in the South, taking um, education to, to people, taking literacy to people, taking healthcare to people, and registering voters. Um, and if you can imagine traveling around a, a county, right, or a state, you would absolutely need a vehicle that would be reliable that you could that you could travel in. So the car, in that sense, really supported the movement. <clears throat> Here you can see um, Martin Luther King on the right ushering some women into a car. This is during the Montgomery bus boycott. It was a fleet of cars purchased by the Montgomery bus boycott uh, team that enabled people to get to work in Montgomery, Alabama during the, bus during the boycott of the bus company. And it was uh, this weapon, the car as a weapon, that enabled them to bankrupt the bus company um, and reduce their income, the revenue of the bus company by 69%. So how does this story end? In 1964, Lyndon Baines Johnson passed major civil rights legislation that extended voting rights and outlawed segregation. The NAACP and other civil rights organizations had been protesting the segregation of the major hotel chains, Howard Johnson's and Hilton and others. And all of a sudden, these are required by law to open to everyone, open to African-Americans. The heart of Atlanta Motel v. United States in 1964 was a white motel owner that challenged this, the um, anti-segregation laws and he lost. And so all of the hotels and motels in the country, all public accommodations had to open to African-Americans. And so African-Americans now are going to these major chain hotels and they're not frequenting the, um, they're not going as much to the the places that ha they have supported in the past, the African-American tourist homes, guest houses, and um, resorts. But the question is, does the story end? Or does this remain an issue in the United States? This is Philando Castile, murdered in his automobile by a Minnesota police officer in 2016 in Falcon Heights, Minnesota. And the officer was acquitted of manslaughter. And I don't know how many of you have seen Kadir Nelson's cover on this week's New Yorker magazine. It's a reminder that for African Americans, going out on the road can still be dangerous. Notice the date in the upper right-hand corner. Stuart Carlson, who drew this cartoon, is a former editorial cartoonist for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And I think it's a very interesting, not terribly funny cartoon.
but it does speak to where we are right now. So the Green Book goes out of business in 1966. And the black hotels and motels gradually lose their clientele to the large chain hotels. But the American landscape was forever changed with the help of ordinary men and women who chose the automobile and travel as their weapon of choice. Yes. Thank you so much, Gretchen. That was, uh, I don't have words. Um, so I didn't notice anyone had any questions in the chat uh, while Gretchen was speaking, uh, but we did allow people to um, send us some advanced questions um, uh, earlier. So I'm gonna ask those questions and uh, while I'm doing that, others of you can um, ask some questions in the chat. Okay, so uh, one of the questions, uh, the first one is from April. Uh, what prompted you to write the book and what research did you have to do to uh, to complete it? A colleague of mine um, who teaches at Bard, Bard College asked me, uh, showed me, asked me if I knew anything about the Green Book, um, probably 25 years ago. And I said, no, I didn't know anything about it, but I was intrigued. And so I started looking, um, looking into the Green Book and that's really what led me into this research. And as I, as the more I did research, the more I discovered that um, I was starting to understand the peculiar behavior of my parents um, when we went on vacation and when we traveled. And so I, I kept digging um, what kind of research did I have to do. What I wanted to do was, was really look at publications from the perspective of African Americans. And if you, if you read the black newspapers, if you read the Chicago newspaper and the Pittsburgh, the, the Chicago uh, newspaper, the Pittsburgh newspaper, the Baltimore newspaper, the black press, you find stories that are not in the white press, that are never mentioned. The stories of lynchings, the stories of dangerous car accidents that killed African American performers because hospitals were segregated. Uh, you start to find all of the stories that are not in, um, that, that never made it to the white press. And so a lot of what I did was read, uh, read publications, magazines, newspapers that were produced within the black community. Okay. Um, uh, another question from Alice. Are there current online resources or apps to advise while traveling through towns, areas known for antagonistic policing? Not that I know of. I think there are probably um, uh, informal networks of people calling one another, letting one another know where there are police hiding or roadblocks and things, but I, I don't know of any, um, any modern resource, any apps. Okay, um, here's one that's uh, ponderous. Uh, was the Green Book the official travel guide recognized by the U.S. Travel Bureau for Black Travelers when Roosevelt declared 1940 as Travel America Year? I'm sorry, that question was asked by Kyla. Forgive me if I... Actually, the, the U.S. Travel Bureau had their own travel guide um, that they produced, and uh, it was basically just, uh, it, was, it was really quite boring looking, a very plain blue cover, and um, it was just like a phone book, basically, name and address. And um, the information and data is so relevant to the challenges, stereotypes, and inequalities that plague our nation today. What would be your message today? And that question is from Joyce. You know, I, I really learned a lot from, uh, I went and and talked to us, I sent to Sylvain Bissonnette, who's the commander in Montreal, and I really learned a lot from um, him. And he's, he's very wise uh, police, policeman. And one of the things that he said was that um, we, are, our, our police officers spend a lot of time going to the shooting range. They have to go to the shooting range regularly and get, and get recertified in shooting but they never have to get recertified in humanity. They never have to get recertified or retrained in, in how to diffuse um, 
problems and how to work with people, how to be a better police officer. So they're constantly getting that training, um, the, the training to be, um, to shoot their guns, but they're not getting the other kind of psychological training and, and how to defuse situations, how to solve problems with people. And I thought that was very wise because um, it, it seems to me that so many of the mistakes that um, police officers are making are because they don't have the skills to do, um, to defuse a situation and they get so angry and they, then they have weapons and they pull out their weapons and kill people. Yeah. One wonders if uh, the incident in Atlanta at the Wendy's uh, would have mm -hmm. ended differently if there had been some better right, because he was, he was running away. He was running right. away. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, we have time for a few more questions and then, uh, then I want to uh, go to the clip, but um, uh, here's one from Douglas. Uh, post 1964, how did business owners and, uh, sorry, businesses owned and operated by African Americans do? Did they decline or grow or, question? There was a significant decline. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it wasn't, um, you know, it, it really wasn't because African Americans completely abandoned them. It was because some African Americans abandoned those businesses and no white Americans, um, you, you know, went to those businesses. So, you know, we're, we're seeing right now, um, several people have called me and said, well, I ordered your book and I ordered it through a black bookstore. And I thought, that's great. Suddenly white Americans are saying, we want to support black businesses. That didn't happen in the 1960s. Um, and, and so the, the black businesses were marginal and just a little bit of, of uh, decline in those businesses really caused many of them to go out of business. Um, here's a, a timely question um, from Kristen. Did you come across any queer black businesses in your research of the Green Book? I'm especially interested in queer black women's businesses. That's a hard question. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't. Um, I did. I didn't. I, I guess I wasn't wasn't looking. Um, and also, it was probably less um, common for people to say that they were um, queer in that time period that I studied. Um, but I'll, I will think about that. And and I, I, yeah, it's possible that I have some information. I'll I'll think about that. Let's see what I can come up with. Okay, so just last question, and then we'll 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 go toward the the video. Um, how were the photos chosen? The the photographs the, in the that I just showed you. I'm sorry, Rachelle Parker is the person who asked that question. So, um, I'm sorry, she doesn't give a really specific. Um, <clears throat> I chose them. <laughs> Okay. I, I, <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, uh, as I said uh, before um, in the first introduction, that we are privileged and honored to have um, two other uh, guests with us, um, and they are going to uh, give us a ten-minute uh, preview of the film that um, Dr. Soren and um, and. I'm going to apologize too officially. Um, when I sent out invitations uh, initially, I said the documentarian was Ken Burns, not Rick Burns, and I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. It is Rick Burns. Uh, I'm going to say his handsomer brother. Does, does that does that make up a little bit there? <laughs> um, uh, Rick Burns is a documentary filmmaker and writer best known for his eight-part, 17-hour series, New York, a docu documentary film, which uh, premiered nationally on PBS to critical acclaim. Burns has been writing, directing, and producing historical documentaries for over 25 years since his collaboration on the PBS series, The Civil War, which he produced with his brother, Ken, and co-wrote with Jeffrey Ward. Since founding Steeplechase in 1989, he has directed many films of note for PBS, including The Donner Party, Into the Deep, America, Wailing, and the World, The Pilgrims, Chinese, uh, the, sorry, The Chinese Exclusion Act, and most recently, Oliver Sacks. 
his own life. Burns was educated at Columbia University and Cambridge University. Uh, we are also joined uh, by Amir Lewis. Uh, having built an exceptional editing career over the years, Amir Lewis's credits span documentaries and narrative genres, beginning with Slam, which received both the prestigious Sundance Grand Jury Prize and the Cannes Camera, Camera d'Or. Okay, I took Spanish, not French. Um, most recently, he has parlayed his editorial experience into a supervising story producer role for the acclaimed Netflix docu-series Rapture. In between filmmaking projects, Amir also teaches the fine art of storytelling at both NYU and Brooklyn College's Firestein Graduate School. Thank you both for joining us. And um, I'm going to ask my colleague to start the video clip. That was tremendous. I'm, I'm speechless. And, I, and I, when is this going to be released on PBS? Do we know yet? Do you have a date? Yeah, it, not an exact date, but it, they, they want to have it on before the election. Oh. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful for an October, you know, kind of a mid-October date. Uh, Excellent. Um, would either of you care to speak before we start asking, I mean, uh, asking questions or um, is there anything in particular that you? Just a, a quick technical caveat um, mm -hmm. to stress that that is very much a work in progress. Uh, so right. to take the number one question off the board, all of the numbers on the screen won't be there. That, that's just temporary archival footage that we, we use to put in the film because you know we can't afford to buy it until we know exactly what we want. So anything that seems like time code on the screen will definitely not be there. It's not some sort of artsy you know, effect that we're adding to it. Uh, as well as uh, I think Doug's email going off, like hearing these little bongs in the background, I, I don't think that that will be in the film. <laughs> and there was also like a Mondrian-esque overlaying of his background onto the screen. I, I, that might actually be in the film. We might put that in there because I thought that was kind of cool, so. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> You know, Joy, uh, Joy I'll, I'll just say quickly, um, first of all, I'm so, uh, so honored that we were included in this evening's presentation. And um, Gretchen, who I've known since the early 1990s, um, and was, you know, an, an incredible interview for our film on the history of New York, um, you know, came to me about five years ago, um, might have been even six, and said, listen, this is going to be your next project. And she sat me down with a laptop with, you know, really hundreds, in fact, thousands of photographs, many of which she showed me. Um, and I was just blown away. And I have to say, sitting here, you know, on June 17th, 2020, um, as her book, which is an incredible book, um, is now published. And as the film project, which she started, and invited me and my colleagues into, um, for which I'm eternally grateful. You know, here we are at an amazing crossroads in American history. And I feel so moved um, to listen to you, Gretchen, speak, and so incredibly grateful that you uh, opened the door to this project because I can't, can't think of anything more meaningful uh, as well as more timely. Um, that's going on in America today. So, you know, my hat's off to you, Gretchen. Thank you. I didn't think we, I don't think we knew how timely it would be. Yeah. Sadly. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly. yeah. Um, so if no one objects, I'm going to start uh, with some questions from the chat. And uh, if there are um, questions that you see that I don't highlight that you feel like you want to um, answer, please feel free to do that. Um, this one comes from Douglas. Uh, does the documentary come to uh, contemporary days? How does their historian and document documentarian work make you view current events? You know, we could all answer that, Amir Gretchen. Um, I'll say that this is one of those stories which is humming the past and whistling the present at the same time. So, the, you know, to, to, to understand the deep 
deep roots of race based and mobility in America to understand that um, the very idea of freedom, um, which was really articulated by the British English jurisprudence prudential scholar uh, William Blackstone in the 18th century is saying, you know, freedom is locomotion. It's auto mobility. You want to, if you want to understand what freedom is, to go back to what Gretchen was saying at the beginning of her wonderful remark, and to understand how unequally auto mobility, mm -hmm. locomotion, self locomotion has been distributed in American history. Um, and how much this is a story which in some sense we all know, but is buried at the same time. So what we found, I found this really remarkable, unlike I think any other project I've had a chance to work, with, work, work on, that you're always thinking about the present as you go through this past, whether it's the Underground Railroad or the Jim Crow period or the arrival of the automobile or the, or the Negro Motorist Green Book. You're, sub, you're gripped continuously by a sense of its, what it means to America and Americans today. Um, and I think that that's, you know, a remarkable tribute to the power of what this piece of American history is. It's not, history isn't was, you know, as Faulkner famously said, history is, is. And I've never felt the isness of history more powerful than in this story. So we do bring the story up I mean, you do see that, you know, driving while black is a kind of like a slightly in your face phrase from the 1990s. You know, it's not from the 1940s. It's not from the era of the Green Book. The fact is, is driving while black has a long, long history. And you're not gonna understand where that phrase comes from until you understand at least some of that history. I don't know, Amir, Gretchen, what, what's your sense of it in terms of coming it down to today? Well, I th I think we it was it was a good thing we hadn't finished, um, because <laughs> I think there's a there's a lot more that's been added, um, and, and somebody asked if we really think this is going to make a difference now, and I keep telling myself as all these horrible things have been happening, I keep telling myself something that Obama said, and that is justice doesn't come in a it doesn't come in a straight line, it's basically one step forward, three steps back. And I think that's, that's the mantra for, for us to stay sane because if we don't just keep pushing, keep trudging along, we're, we're gonna be hopeless. You know, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> uh, at least I will be hopeless. <laughs> so I think we have to keep thinking that if we can move one step forward, as a result of this, as a result of so many white allies saying that they are now getting it, that they now understand, I think that's really um, a step a step ahead. Okay, Amir, did you want to comment? Um, yes, I, I perhaps uh, less hopeful than my compatriot, uh, just because by nature I'm a cynic. Uh, <laughs> <and it's, laughs> As far as it being contemporary, I mean, the, the eerie thing about the condition of black folks in this country is that, uh, as I was saying to Gretchen uh, when I saw her uh, last week, um, it, it's almost like there is that one step forward, two or three steps back, mm -hmm. but it's also like being in the greatest, most cruel version of shoots and ladders uh, ever invented. <laughs> uh, you, you know, where we're allowed to climb up a very small ladder or, and then we're on this giant yeah, slide, yeah. you know, back to some, some other positions. So I think what we're really hoping to do with the documentary is, is sort of illustrate that there are things going on in 1937 that are eerily similar to things taking place in 2017, which are eerily evocative of something that took place in 1951. You know, and uh, if we can sort of show, because there's always this sense of that was so long ago. Things were mm -hmm. terrible a long time ago, but it's so much different now. When, but when you start to line these things up in a timeline, uh, which is very easy to do, uh, on a you know computer-based editing software, you start to see, wow, this is all really, really, really similar. And I think that will help perhaps open some eyes. Um, and as far as bringing it up to the contemporary, I think Rick 
can attest to this. I said, all we have to do is leave a 32 second hole at the end of our film and we will be able to fill it with what, whatever the latest atrocity of the moment is. Because as horrible as the situation with George Floyd is, there will be another one. That is one thing that uh, our research uh, you know, and the film has shown us says that sadly there there will be another one, and so we will have a small section, uh, you know, a hole uh, in the film set for whatever the the, the latest one is. Um, but then again, I'm a cynic, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Um... I don't think that you're necessarily cynical so much as you're mm -hmm. realistic. And um, if, oh, but that's, a, that's a, another debate. Um, I have a, a note from Karen. Uh, please ask Gretchen if she thinks we are in the midst of a second civil rights movement. Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Um, I, I hope we are. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful that young people are now motivated. I think the young people that, that I've been teaching for the last several years have not been as um, motivated as, as they seem to be now. And um, having, um, I, call, I called my son in California last week and, and I could hear all this noise in the background and I said, where are you? And then I could hear, Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! And he said, Mom, I'm at a rally. And I thought, wow, he, um, you know, decided that he was going to go to a rally even in the midst of a pandemic. And I think um, this is a disease, racism is a disease that um, people are now deciding to, they've had enough. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure why it was this particular straw that broke the camel's back, but probably it's the the, the COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic that made people stop and pay attention. So something is happening. And I think that's a very good thing. I don't know if it's going to be another, another civil rights movement. And one of the things that I do tell people is African-Americans have been fighting for civil rights since the first African-Americans stepped onto these shores. And we define the civil rights movement as happening only in the 1960s. But there have been people who have been fighting for this from the very beginning. Um, so it's, it's really a continuation rather than a, a new civil rights movement, I think. Um, but what's, what's a little bit heartening, Amir, is that white allies are joining and, and, and sometimes that makes all the difference. You know, I, I think I would just add to that, Gretchen. You know, um, my older son, Simon, you know, was out at a rally. A week yeah, ago. I know. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, up in Saratoga Springs. Um, and I, I do think that the COVID situation with respect to, um, you know, how terribly, uh, how terribly, badly it's hit um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Neighborhood, neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's really only in America with the epicenter of the coronavirus um, epidemic be in the neighborhoods of Corona and North Corona in Queens, um, which is just yeah. an extraordinary yeah, yeah. Thing, AOCs. And I think that, you know, the vulnerability that everyone feels right now um, is really a key to the increased white allies. If people feel really existentially threatened in a way that is across the board. Mm. I think my feeling is, is that not necessarily for African Americans, but for non African Americans, there's a strong sense of vulnerability, which is really mm. open, open hearts. Interesting. Made people feel, you know what? This, this stuff can't stand. This is you, lives, lives are too vulnerable anyway. Mm -hmm. But an ability to sort mm -hmm. of bait across lines that might not have been the case 10 years ago or at least for a lot of people. And that's my strong sense. So maybe what's happening right now is really a thing in white America um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in, the COVID, in the COVID situation. Um, and I don't mean across the board and Amira, I know it is you know, a step forward and a step back, but it, it does feel like at the very least, this is a moment to seize hold of. Um, and if 
people can double down on the convictions and the emotion, it may be possible to move the, move the, the, move the needle. Move the needle. Right. Um, I'm just scrolling back up through some of the earlier questions. Um, uh, Maria asked, uh, or she says, you talked about segregation in national parks. Do you know, can you share knowledge about national wildlife refuges? Refuge, uh, um, refuges, yeah, that's it. Okay, or state parks or campsites. Informants talked about how African American, one of our informants talked about how African Americans don't love going out into the woods alone. Um, and I think that it could contribute to one of the, you know, to some trepidation about going to wildlife refuges and, and, and national parks. You don't know what white people you're going to encounter in the woods. And that could be dangerous as well. And, and that's one of the reasons that African Americans don't like to go to wilderness areas. I know when we always went camping, we went, we did go in New Jersey and we went to areas that were patrolled, ironically enough, because my father didn't want to go really out in the woods where you were unprotected. I, I just don't like bugs, but yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that too. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, my family will, is probably laughing because I'm also allergic to everything under the sun. So, <laughs> um, um, uh, there was another question uh, earlier. Um, well, someone sure. someone said something about they've heard a stereotype that African Americans don't like nature, and it's not nature; it's the fear of the people that might be in the woods. Mm -hmm. Also true. Um, I'm sorry, I lost that earlier question. Uh, someone asked about AAA and uh, whether they were assistive to African Americans. Uh, AAA was incredibly prejudiced and, and segregated. And there was actually a AAA for African Americans. It was very difficult to get membership in AAA or, or similar automobile club and to get automobile insurance was, was tough um, for black drivers. And I, I think that Green named his book the Green Book because AAA used to put out a blue book of places huh. to stay, but it, it completely ignored African-Americans. Um, and AAA, um, AAA was just as segregated as um, any other business in America. Okay, sorry, I'm scrolling through these as fast as I can. Um, and I, I'm trying to get ones that aren't sort of uh, repetitive of early of questions that you've already answered. Um, uh, you were giving a shout out to, to Dr. Soren uh, about being a, a Jersey girl. I, I'd like to, I'm a hardcore native New Yorker. I'd like to give a shout out to New Jersey and the New Jersey State Troopers for giving us the title of both our film and our book. Uh, because of the, <laughs> the wonderful profiling of the New Jersey State Troopers in 1994, That's we true. would not have the term driving while black. So, shout out to y'all. <laughs> see, see, Amir, that's not cynical. I was no, say, not at that's, all. That's wow. That's <laughs> it's, it's it's touching. That's that's, that's that's New Yorkers taking shots at, at their friends across the river. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> and well deserved. We okay. I think they have the worst uniforms too. I think the uniforms are very um, scary. Not Nazi -like. fascist. Yeah, proto fascist. They, yeah, they are. Yeah, I was. I wasn't going to use that word, but I, <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. They're terrible. Okay. Um, another, well, so uh, I guess a part two to that AAA question is, um, has AAA ever acknowledged its racist past? Uh, not that I have ever seen. I have never seen anything um, where they apologize. They just all of a sudden one day embraced everyone 
and embraced, you know, they just, that was it. They, hmm. no, they didn't acknowledge it. Okay. That I've ever found anyway. So uh, thank you, Doug, for reprinting your question from, from earlier. Um, in the cartoon, I guess question number two in the cartoon that you had earlier, um, it seems odd, a mess. How does one know what's a lawful order and when dealing with the police, does it matter, especially considering how often African-Americans are ill-treated? What's a lawful order from the police? Yeah. So just recently, my daughter, who has a four-year-old and a six-year-old, sent me a video that she has shown to her children, which is, now they're four-year-old, two, two little girls, four and six. And it's a video that shows um, a dad talking to his daughter, who's eight years old, about what she does if, she's in, if she encounters the police. And she stands and she puts her hands up in the air like this and she says, um, she says her name and she says, I am not armed and I cannot hurt you. This is an eight year old little girl. And they've practiced this so she knows exactly what to say. And my daughter was in tears that she has to say this to her children. Um, and I, you know, I, it really, now I, I even lost your, tell me your question again, I just lost it. Uh, what is a lawful order by the police? Oh, oh. so. So when one of the things that I think all of us tell our children is that whatever a police officer says to you, you will obey at the moment. You keep your hands on the wheel, you turn the light on in the car, you do not reach for your wallet, you do not reach for your phone, you do, if you can turn your phone on and your camera on, you do that. But you do not reach for anything. You don't give the officer any opportunity to shoot you. And to say, I was afraid of this person, therefore I shot this person. So you don't move. And, um, you know, one of the things I learned from um, Sylvan, I keep bringing him up, but he was, he was really my, my police guide through this, this process. And he said, you know, if somebody walks all the way up to your window and they're afraid of you, they've made a mistake. You know, they shouldn't, if they're afraid of you, they shouldn't go up to your window and then they're going to shoot you right? Then they've made a mistake, but you're dead. Um, so it, it's so important that you don't give police officers any reason to fear you because your job as the child um, of the, the teenager, the young, young driver of an African-American family, your job is to stay alive long enough so your parents can get to you and get you out of whatever trouble you're in. So you do exactly what they tell you to do if you're stopped because you don't have a gun and they do. So those, you know, those, are the, those are the rules that every child is told by their, their black parents. I tried to convince my, both my son and my son-in-law never to wear a hoodie. Don't wear a hoodie because the perception is that if you're wearing a hoodie, you must be a criminal. Not if you're white. If you're wearing a hoodie and sneakers, you're a kid. If you're black and you're wearing a hoodie and, and sneakers, you're a criminal. So you, I think you have to be very careful where you're going and what, you know, and what you say all the time. You know, that, that really brings us to, again. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. What were you going to say? No, I, I was just going to say, listening to what you're saying, Gretchen, you know, they're, they're the places where the rubber meets the road on any of these incidents where, you know, someone dies or someone is killed. But listen to what you're saying is this whole deeply internal, internalized culture mm -hmm. in which all the time spent thinking and feeling in advance, worrying, wondering, mm -hmm. and navigating, kind of negotiate, which is not, white Americans don't have that in any way. There is absolutely no corresponding reality that white Americans have where they have to prepare themselves right. for these eventualities. And so I just think it's really crucial. And I hope that, you know, people reading your book or seeing the film that we're making to understand that the violence is deeply, deeply internalized. It is affecting people's behaviors and thoughts and anticipations and plans and 
what they wear and where they go and where they don't go and can they go into the woods and should they wear a hoodie. I mean, that's an amazing, I mean, just, just in a few sentences, Gretchen, you um, articulated a whole universe of behavior, not one of which actually has to do with, in fact, getting killed in your car. Right. But what you're trying to do to avoid that happening for you or for your child. I mean, that's just astonishing. Sorry, Amir, go ahead. No, no, I, I agree. And I agree with what, what Gretchen was saying as well. It's like, because what she's saying is the sort of ultimate restriction on the mobility of black lives, right? Watch what you say, watch what you wear. Why, you know, and there's entire lists of people who've been shot for holding a wallet, people who've been shot for holding a cell phone, people who've shot because they didn't listen to the police, people who right. got shot because they did listen to the police. So it's almost like you can't win, right? So it's just these things more and more. And at what, what point, when there have been restriction upon restriction upon restriction placed on your mobility, um, at what point are you living anymore? You know, are you, are, you know, you sort of cease to be as a human being if you can't move uh, about in space, you know, freely. And it's like, I have never, nor probably will I ever have a, a cross burnt on my lawn, right? Part of that is because I live in New York and I don't have a lawn, but it, it's probably <laughs> never, ever going to happen to me, right? Like, so I'm not dealing with that version of racism. I'm dealing with the great grandchildren of that version of racism where I go to a city bank and I'm getting some money out uh, and then a white woman comes up and she takes the stall, the little you know thing next to me and I'm about to leave, but I don't wanna leave at the same time she leaves just on the off chance that she might glance over her shoulder and think that she just took money out and now I'm up to no good. So I start checking my balance to give her a chance to leave. And it's a six second thing, right? Six seconds out of my life, but I have to do that. Or I think that I have, now she hasn't paid any attention to me at all. She might not see me, even if she did see me, she might not be thinking the thing that I think that she's thinking, but I'm doing it to myself because that's the self-policing, you know, that I have to do, that I, uh, that I feel like I need to do in order to protect my sense of self, just so that I don't get that glance, you know? So. You know, one of the things that with the George Floyd uh, that, that really struck me was that I, I passed without knowing it a counterfeit hundred dollar bill a couple of years ago because I went to the bank and the bank gave me a counterfeit bill. And I then took that bill to another bank and handed it in and they recognized it as a counterfeit. And I thought, wow, they didn't call the police on me. They didn't call because they know me and I bank there they just confiscated the bill. But, you know, I don't know if anybody is, has said this about George Floyd, but passing a counterfeit bill is something that happens all the time. All the time. Because, you know, who, who goes through their money and looks and says, oh, this is counterfeit, this is real. There's a lot of counterfeit money out there and you shouldn't get the death penalty for passing a counterfeit bill. Um, it, it, it just happens, it happens all the time. And the way that counterfeiters pass money, it's they slip small amounts of money into the, um, into the money chain all the time. They don't go in with a big bag of counterfeits. They just pass a, a counterfeit 20 here and a counterfeit 100 there and a counterfeit 50 there um, because it's easier. Um, and that's what George Floyd did was he, he passed a counterfeit 20. Nobody knows, you know, he, he may not have known that it was a counterfeit bill. I certainly didn't when I passed the counterfeit hundred. Do you, do you lose the hundred dollars in that scenario? Oh yes. Or does your bank give it to you? No, what happens is that the, um, the FBI has to be called. It's a requirement that they, they call the FBI and then um, they confiscate the bill. But what ended up happening, because it was given to me by one bank, I went back to that bank and assured them that I would be very unpleasant if they didn't give me back the hundred dollars and they gave it back to me. <laughs> yeah, well, you were very lucky because that could have very easily been angry black woman storms into bank, demands hundred dollars. And, and gets, the the no. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the bank where we carried our mortgage. So, you know, it, it makes it. You difference. had a little leverage, right? Yeah, just a little. <laughs> 
Well, um, it's, I'm going to, there was one more question in the chat from earlier. So I will ask that. Um, uh, and it was actually uh, Rachel who was asking, um, when did the, the KKK signs start to come down? In, uh, I guess it depends on where you're, what, where you're talking about. I think in New Jersey, the Klan was most popular in the 20s and 30s, and you don't find signs after the 20s and 30s. But in the South, uh, the, the KKK signs don't, come, don't start coming down until, start coming down in the late 50s. And, um, but, you, but you find there was, I think, Palo Alto, California had a KKK sign on the street, painted on the street in the 70s. So it, I guess it depends on where you're living and uh, how strong the Klan, how, how powerful the Klan is. I realized I'm muted. I'm sorry. I was talking. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I hate to, to, to end on that note, but uh, we're about five minutes from our time and I don't want to um, keep you longer than you um, agreed. We are so very grateful to all of you for, for sharing your, your knowledge, your expertise and your insights uh, into what has been going on in the world right now and how um, history has um, shaped and is continuing to shape um, what is going on. Um, I do want to thank um, some people again, acknowledge um, uh, the, we, uh, again, we'd like to thank Dr. Gretchen Sullivan Soren, Rick Burns and Amir Lewis. Um, that film is coming out on PBS again, uh, we say approximately October. Yep. Um, uh, so we all have that to look forward to. And, um, you know, actually, uh, we didn't mind, uh, the numbers so much across the, um, the screen, the video and the, you know, the other aesthetic uh, touches and, you know, Doug, we do appreciate, you know, <laughs> uh, your, your light touch. Uh, so if you want to, uh, screen the film with us, uh, even an unfinished cut, we'd be, you know, we'd be happy to, to help you out there. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, uh, we'd like to thank uh, the Piscataway African American Seniors Club and their president, Joyce Coles, for agreeing to co-sponsor this program and for helping to spread the word. Um, uh, we'd also like to thank Susan DeBruin. I'm mispronouncing that last name. I apologize. Uh, Sue DeBruin. DeBruin, um, who brought the book Driving All Black to our attention through our book chats. Um, and, you know, side note to which all of you are more than welcome to, uh, to just drop in uh, um, uh, and for making the introductions to between Dr. Soren and me. Um, thank you again, Sue. Uh, we'd like to um, thank Piscataway Public Library Director Heidi Kramer, who encouraged and supported this program. Uh, and I'd also like to thank my coworkers uh, who work tirelessly behind the scene, Melissa Shabel, Kathleen DiGiulio, Suzanne Henning. Uh, Doug Baldwin, Kate Baker, and so many others uh, who were, you know, helping to support uh, this program in, in so many small and um, immeasurable ways. Again, um, thank you to our audience uh, for uh, participating and um, for being engaged, for um, wanting to uh, support this kind of programming. Um, it, it means a lot. Uh, libraries are uh, struggling to meet your needs and you are helping us do that by telling us telling us very strongly that these are the kinds of programs um, that you want us to um, to bring to you um, uh, my coworkers know I can ramble for for a long time so I'm going to stop uh, <laughs> for, and say again a sincere and humble thanks to dr. Soren to uh, Rick Burns and to Amir Lewis for joining us and um, Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much, everybody. So much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was fantastic. Thank bye you bye. So much. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, Gretchen. Take care. Bye, Be Mir. safe. Bye. bye. Yeah, you too. Be safe. Be safe. Keep your head up. <laughs>